Okay. Take it away, Justin. <laughs> uh, so I first I did something that will require some undoing, probably. Um, I so it's, since this is my first presentation and I didn't want to have uh, everything fall down on my head, I went with a safe option and made a, a Beamer presentation. So later I'll re you know we we can talk and 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 you tell me what I need to do to make this uh, mergeable with the rest and that'll be fine. But for the purposes of, of this, I did something that I knew, even if it's suboptimal. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start. Okay, so can all of you see what looks like may, might become a presentation? Yep, you see a good. slide? Yep. Yes, indeed. Okay, oh, I'm a little bit worried. And does it, do you see it uh, changing? We do not. We see the window of the PDF. I see. Okay. So not. I just need to share my entire screen probably. Okay. So it doesn't like that it's full screen, I think. Um, all right. Just so, make sure you're not sharing anything that you don't want to share. Okay. That has changed. <laughs> <laughs> that has changed. All right. No, I think what I'm going to do is just do this. Uh, I'm going to try to minimize things as much as possible. Um, unfortunately, the beautiful full screen is going to not be an option. All right. So, um, all right. So, John alluded to some degrees of freedom I had in choosing what to do. Um, so, I basically just went through the labs, but um, I did the code pretty differently than they had the code. Um, I did at least a little bit of, of tidy models for all the different parts. Um, so I look forward to people who are more experienced in tidy models telling me more efficient ways I could have done things. That's actually like my secret ploy today is like have people tell me more efficient ways to do things. Okay, so validation set approach. And um, I just put this quote here just to remind us of like what's going on at all in the specific case of the auto data set. But we're trying to estimate test error rates from fitting various models. Uh, to do both model assessment and model selection. That's like the, the whole gist of today's chapter. So they did a couple uh, validation sets. I decided R has loops. So I did, I don't know how many thousands, but so, so this is kind of some, some variation and this is, um, you know, every dot is a different um, validation set error rate and uh, with the means being the dots and the medians being the lines, you can see that those are mostly on top of each other. Uh, and, you know, some nice interquartile ranges there. Um, but so as you can see, there's quite a bit of variation, uh, at least in this data set of, I think, what is it, 400 something? When you divide it in half, fit the model on half, and then get the error rate for the other half. Um, and so, so this is, as you all actually know, like extremely easy to do in, in R. So actually there's this kind of like a, it's kind of like seeing a vestigial approach where I started to do it in, in tidy models. I created the test and training data sets there as opposed to just using like extremely basic indexing. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second, but uh, fitting this is extremely easy with just uh, replicate. And, and indeed the numbers come out to be the same as you know, are in the same ballpark as uh, those in the book. Um, so yeah, and, and this, this inline uh, manipulation of horsepower became kind of the bane of my existence when moving to tidy models. So, but I'll, I'll move on to that in a second. Uh, so, so, okay, so again, this chapter is called validation set approach. And if you look in the tidy models uh, documentation, you'll see that they have a function called validation split. So just, this is literally copy and pasted, it takes a single random sample without replacement from the original data set to be used for analysis. All the data points are in the assessment set. Uh, assessment being the test set and analysis. And again, there's this, the terminological mess here is, uh, is impressive. Uh, so it's defaults are to take half, or sorry, three fourths uh, and put them in the assessment set. And then, you know, you can stratify and other sorts of stuff. And so just by way of example, for those of you who are at least somewhat initiated into tidy models, uh, you would be familiar with doing something like this. You'd be familiar with taking your data set, performing an initial split, getting a split object, 
And then depending on exactly what your workflow is, you might need to take out a training set and do something like this. Um, okay, so you might think, okay, again, so what do I do? I take, since now that I'm doing the validation approach, you know, I get the validation split on my uh, original data set and I do something like this. And what do I get? Uh, I get this object with splits, you know, two columns, splits and ID, splits being like the more interesting one. But, uh, and that's a perfectly valid object in R and it's fine. And you can use uh, this, you know, the first row, first column object here. But I guess it's important to point out, and this is <laughs> uh, not centered, and, and I apologize for those of you squinting and, and how unesthetic it is. Um, but so the way that they think of validation is not just you take your data set and you get an assessment and analysis set. It's that you first make uh, the initial split, which is why it's named that initial split is to separate testing uh, from not testing. And so this was the moment where I realized, uh, I came, I guess, late to realize that uh, that tidy models is probably a pretty um, opinionated API, as, as they would say. So anyway, so that was something I learned in this. Uh, obviously, I did not learn how to center an image in Beamer. Um, so, so what you would do is something more like this. You would do uh, your initial split, you get out your training data, and then on, and because you do need to pass a data frame to validation split, you would pass that to of training. But I'm not going to dive too much in that. Uh, although one thing I will say is you can tidy it, and it's nice, and you get back a tibble with you know row and this. I didn't expect it to be able to tidy that, but sometimes it's fun just to tidy things and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> that says more about me than about tidies, about broom, I think. Um, so you can see you know the class of again this is the validation split object. This is the more, most important thing, is that it's an R set object. Uh, you, there's like help pages and you know things you can check out on the Tidy Models website. Actually, it's on the R sample website, the specific package for that. Um, about you know doing fancier things with R set objects. The one that you really want though that's usable is this R split object, and you do have to kind of dig into it to get it. Um, sorry, dig into to this object. Okay, I think I'm gonna leave it there, but I, oh yeah, I would say that once you do get out the R split object, um, then you can, then they have functions for uh, analysis and assessment, and they do just give you exactly what you would, you would hope. They give you out a data frame. Um, by the way, if, if any of you later wanna tell me the advantage of using slice head overhead, I'm, I'm, I'm still, that's another thing I'm still trying to figure out. Um, and then analysis and assessment, also work on the initial split object, which seems like maybe it shouldn't have work, but uh, but this is where normally on an initial split object, again, you normally use testing and training, but analysis and assessment do the exact same thing. So, so I'm not sure about that. Anyway, so that's a very long excursion on uh, validation sets and, and tidy models. So leave or not cross validation, the best acronym I think in the game. Um, it's very easy to do. And in, in, in base R, um, you just create, or I just created uh, a matrix where I'm gonna put all my squared errors, because um, that's all I'm gonna save, that's all I'm interested in the models. I'm not like bootstrapping their, uh, I'm not doing a jackknife of their uh, uncertainty estimates for the parameters, which would be very similar to this. Maybe if you, you know, if you're doing, if you're doing leave or not cross validation, I guess you might as well get jackknife er er errors for your confidence cut for your parameters. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, so it's just this, um, I decided to go crazy and go all the way to the 10th polynomial force power. Why not? Uh, this is like extremely fast. One thing that I was dismayed by is that this is extremely slow in tidy models. Um, but we can see I have a going to the loo graph. Sorry that the, uh, that the uh, labels are, sorry not the labels, the text is just too small. But anyway, uh, so that's what that looks like. Um, again, this all this was just generated by uh, getting column means from this big old squared error matrix. Uh, and as you can see, basically what they talk about in the book that you know you uh, get some flexibility, go to a quadratic, things get as good as they're going to get pretty much. Um, and so okay, so again, very easy to do and very fast to do at least with a small data set and a simple model. 
in base R. Now, to do this all at once in tiny models, the way that I, it occurred to me to do it, um, and maybe like here's why it was slow, it's because this was an efficient way. And there were many things I learned and suffered through here. The, one of those was not though, how to implement Lucid as far as getting the right, what they call the right folds. Um, so, so here you just use their vfield CV, which is another um, function from our sample that you give it their data set, your data set. And, uh, and this is actually the split object, by the way. This should be the training data set. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, and then you give it as many folds as there are rows in the data set. Uh, so that's how you would implement lu CV. Um, because it's just k fold where k equals n. All right, so, so there's that. That was the relatively easy part. The more complicated part is that um, in tidy models, if you want to compare models where a certain regressor <clears throat> goes, you know, has different uh, powers, you have to use, you cannot specify that in the formula. So what you would do is you would always say that my formula is miles per, ga per gallon regressed on the horsepower. But if I want a quadratic model, I don't change the formula. I add a step below a pre-processing step where I say I want horsepower to the second degree. And if I want a cubic, I say to the third degree. Uh, and that would be fine. But then um, there, if you, if you look at what actually step poly does, you know, you think step poly, oh, add a polynomial term. It adds, it adds orthogonal polynomials. So that's something I, I didn't take the time to investigate. I find that to be an amazingly puzzling default. If any of you have, if any of you more ML heads have a, an explanation to why that is the default, to have orthogonal polynomials be the default instead of just, you know, polynomials. And it's, it's not even relatively simple. I mean, it's relatively simple once you see it, but it took me a little bit to figure out like, oh, there's not just a thing where I'd be like, oh, I want a raw one. I have to pass this, you know, to some, the underlying function via options as a list uh, to get just like horsepower squared. And I found that to be, that was, that was 30 minutes of head scratching. And head scratching is a euphemism for, for more upset emotions. Um, so, so anyway, but so anyway, that's how, that's how you do it. So you get this thing called a workflow set. And now we're like, really, this is full tidy model stuff. And a workflow set is just a combination of preprocessors with models, um, models being in the sense of like linear model, um, you know, decision tree with a certain engine, right? So that's what the, the models part is. And then again, because it's all in the tidyverse, you map it, you map your, your set to a specific folds object, which in this case is the, the CV, uh, sorry, the, the leave one out cross validation. And then um, I wanted to save my predictions and stuff, blah, blah, blah. So this took a long time. This, like each one of these took over a minute to fit, which was just, uh, so like three minutes for that model, which in base R took like the whole thing took 20 seconds tops. But sure enough, so, so this is also another, this was a moment, I'm just gonna put this out here. Um, okay, so I'll start not the way that people read things. I'll start at the bottom. Um, so if you group by the workflow ID and you get the MSE, for both, you get the same numbers that we've been seeing. Uh, you get this big drop of about five uh, between the base and then the cubic and quadratic. Oh, that was weird, that order. Anyway, um, oh, I see. Okay, yeah, never mind. That order is not weird. Um, so you get, you get what you'd expect. Uh, but then if you use their... Um, so, so they have a collect metrics, they being, I guess, Silgi and Kuhn have a collect metrics. And uh, one of those is RMSE standard uh, in the book. And it actually occurred to me that um, I'm not sure why in the book they, they're big on mean squared error as opposed to getting uh, standard deviation of it, which is something you'd have to like square to get in uh, tidy models. But anyway, these numbers, terrifyingly, <laughs> are not the square roots of these numbers. Um, 
and that's something and it's this is not a localized thing um I, I, I see Shram go for page for not one. I tried, I tried that. Um, it didn't work, it didn't work out. Um, sorry, I just peeked in the comments. Uh, so anyway, this was something that I don't know what's going on. If any of you know of anything that happens with RMSE in, in tidy models, but um, what's, what's, what's bizarre about it is that they have, it's the same kind of structure, this you know, sizable drop, and then these two are, are relatively similar. Um, but of course, um, the orders should be a little bit different. Um, three, two, are this organized? Oh no, no, right. The orders, the order is fine. So it's like picking up the same thing, but the actual quantity is not what I would think it is. So th this had me going into serious doubts about whether I even understood what a root mean squared error was <laughs> versus a mean squared error. I was like, oh no, I've got my order of operations all wrong. Like this has induced a uh, serious soul issues so um so yeah so i'm just gonna put that out there for now um but, but go ahead I, I, no i I'm, is there another column that makes more sense in the original data like if you leave out the select you've got me so, soul searching that i don't understand anything either so <laughs> i don't know like I don't know what's going wrong here. Yeah, no, I mean, so the way that this comes out is that by, by, by default, because MPT yeah. is a, okay, so I'll just say it for the people who don't know, because uh, miles per gallon is a quantitative variable. So collect metrics, I suppose, detects that, or I probably detects that it's a, a linear regression and uh, gives me two metrics for each model. It gives me the RMSE and the R squared coefficient of determination, however you want to call it. Uh, and so what, you know, filter does, oh, and so they're in this, their metric column. So, uh, so this just gets out the RMSEs um, because for leaving out cross-validation, you just get a bunch of NAs for R squared. Uh, so anyway, so all this is doing, again, everyone here I'm sure knows, the player uh, is just getting out the rows that are RMSE. And then the, it's a big table that has a lot of useless information for our purposes. Uh, and so this just gets the, the mean for each model. So it averages over the 320, sorry, 392 folds uh, of the data set. So, so, uh, so yeah. <laughs> so, so this is not, so at least I feel confident this is not getting the wrong number. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like it seemed right. I just, it trying, I'm searching. Uh, Ray, you've done a lot with tidy models and this book is there anything that you see yeah i so i haven't coded up this chapter yet okay i want to and i'm <laughs> just and i love what you're doing man um and i'm gonna i will take this apart my only thought is i wonder if that is not the measurement of the error but if it's um if it's a, an actual prediction so if this is predicting a continuous outcome. I wonder if that is the the overall mean of the predictions. Uh, just a guess, just a guess, and I I will look at it. But yeah, I don't I know. Yeah. So what it could be is you can tune on different parameters. So you uh -huh. can tune to optimize your RMSE. You could tune to optimize um, mean squared error, I don't even know. So right. I'd have to look and see that that'd be the only thing I think about is it, it's giving you answers for tuning to different things, but that's 100% guessery. Yeah. But I yeah. mean, it's the same, it's the same data set for the mean squared error below. Yeah. So yeah, that know. is the thing, is that these two really should have a one-to-one -one correspondence because with leaving out cross-validation, again, this yeah. is, you know, I mean, they should be the exact same. I mean, yeah. and they should be the square root, uh, but they're not. So it's a big mystery. Um, it's not going to be resolved. I'm just going to move on. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, I'm going to scroll to the next page. I'm not going to click on it. Uh, okay, so so now we're, we're letting K be free. K doesn't have to be in anymore. 
is freed from the shackles of the, that FD constriction. So uh, this is gonna be super brief because it's the exact same code, just now, uh, again, sort of abusing what Sylvie and Kuhn had uh, as the idea for, for what a uh, validation set is. I'm just using the original data set. And here I'm saying, um, oh, also, if anyone knows why it gets to be V fold CV, I've also been curious about that. Uh, in any case, I guess maybe to not have it be like K neighbors. I don't know. Um, so, anyway, here, so this is 10. So this is the exact same. Again, workflow set. The only difference is that when I go to map my, my set to my folds object, uh, it is now this auto tenfold CV. Um, and so, so there's that, and I, I'm pretty much just gonna leave it at that, uh, except for, oh, I decided to do this. Um, let's see, what have I done here? I've, oh yeah. So you notice this time, <laughs> they're still different, but they're much closer. Uh, so again, so I did it the manual way, um, collecting predictions and then blah, 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 and getting numbers that correspond to basically what we get in the book. Uh, and then I did, again, I got RMSE from these, uh, and then, then I just squared it. Um, and you'll see now, now the base one is within one. So this is actually, th these could be right, like these could be. Um, the same because you know there's more validation or sorry variation now that they're different folds so there's no expectation that they're the exact same still kind of you know so I think that these might be the same again I'm just using the same collect metric so something went weird with uh, leave one out cross validation but it shouldn't have it shouldn't make a difference but somehow it did um, anyway so so that's that's going to be the end of, of that now the bootstrap um, all right, 30 minutes. Uh, there are a lot of slides here, but this will go fast. Um, so we're in a different territory here. We're basically going to be looking at estimates of not uh, prediction uncertainty, but uncertainty in estimates of a parameter. So I just thought I'd say it's another Tuesday afternoon, right, Colin, and you want to get an uncertainty of the estimate on our point estimate of uh, the median bill length of LD penguins, right? I'm sure we've all had that feeling come, after, uh, come over us. Um, so again, so this is just getting out the, the vector of, of bill length. Still not satisfied on my capitalization conventions here for things that require a lot of parts. Anyway, so super random. Um, I had some missing values. Got to get those out. So just see, okay, so you're interested in the median, but first, you know, you want to check, make sure you, you understand this. Uh, we're going to use this boot function that uh, I was skeptical about when I saw it in the book. I've become less skeptical. So um, I mean, skeptical of its utility, just to be clear, not like that it's poorly programmed or something. Uh, so, okay, so if you just get the mean and then you get the standard error in, in a one line, uh, you, get that, you get these numbers here. And so this boot function, which I do commend, I do commend to all of you after, after some experience with it, uh, does require that you kind of create your custom functions. So you have to create like boot mean, unless you want to do it you know, in line. Uh, in the boot call, but you have to create a function that takes in data indices. So it always has to take, always has to take two arguments and then you pass it indexed data like this. Um, and so then you'll say you take your vector um, and you can give it a data set as well. But I'm gonna start with a simple use case as they say. So you pass boot the vector you're interested in uh, is the slightly custom function you've created and the number of uh, bootstrap samples that you want. And you notice, you know, as a good, uh, a good bootstrap will do, um, or I suppose as a good standard error calculation will do. I don't know, these two approximate each other very well. They're very similar. Um, and here, if I had done the due diligence, I would, have all, I would have given you all a histogram of bill length. So you could have been either amazed or not amazed but I forgot to do that. Uh, so you don't know how impressive it is that the bootstrap and the standard error agree to that extent. But anyway, so anyway, so this is the basic um, structure of, of, of boot. All right, but so anyway, so now I want to boot the median. So we have a median of 38.8 in the data set. Again, we have to create a custom function that takes data indices, and then it just returns <laughs> the median. 
uh, and you get this. And so you get a nice little standard error estimate for the median. Okay, but now more complicated things. What if um, you wanted to get the, the interquartile range? Um, and I guess you don't really get the range, you get the uh, 75th and 25th percentile, but that's fine. I, I just wanted to show that you can also give it a function. So now I'm creating a slide. So this is not all in one line now. It could have been though, uh, where, I get, where I use quantile to get the 25th and 75th percentile. Um, and I think I still missed the values at that time. So that's why that's there. Uh, and yeah, and so Bootstrap can get you multiple statistics at once. Okay, uh, not super helpfully labeled in the, the print output. Uh, there, they, you can tidy this and it's nice. So just so you know. Um, but so yeah, so you can get uh, two parameters at once, no big deal. So then moving on, you can get bootstrap confidence in all, for entire models, which is pretty nice. So this is just, so I, I used to, I remember that I had done this for one of my own models. So I thought I would just uh, throw that in here instead of using the same auto one. So at one point in my life, I ran a, uh, I was predicting number of publications that resulted from National Science Foundation grants, NSF grants. So it's a count model, so it's a Poisson model. Uh, those of you who have looked into this know that Poisson models assume that the variance of the out of the outcome condition on the uh, regressors is, uh, well, the assumption is that it's the same, uh, but over dispersion means that the variance is greater than the mean. And so basically, uh, all your standard errors are overly optimistic if you run just a straight Poisson, Poisson uh, model and you don't make any adjustments. Um, but if you think that the Poisson model is the correct model, uh, then uh, Jeffrey Wooldridge is like big name in econometrics in, in my life. Uh, in any case, so, so one time, when he, like when he very first got on Twitter, this is like Twitter history, his like, he wrote like a 10, <laughs> you know, he's like a 60 year old man writing like a tweet storm about Poisson models. So anyway, I find that amusing. Okay, so this is actually incredibly simple. Um, and this is why I, I started liking it. So um, all you have to do is do a slightly more complicated version of what I was doing earlier with mean, median, and then the quantile function. Um, you just create something that's got, takes some data indices. In this case, to make it general, I wanted to give it formula and family. Uh, so I could have a boot GLM. So, so this is gonna be, the, I guess, the workhorse of that. Um, so for the particular, um, you know, for my application, I had this, this regression was the one I needed to run. Um, um, so anyway, so the way to do it is just, you give boot your uh, data set, which is, that's what mine was called. Um, it's boot GLM, the formula family, and then I did 10,000 iterations. Um, and just real quick, I just want to show you that you can tidy this up. And so these give you the, you know, statistics standard errors. So that's nice. So you could, you know, make that into a nice uh, regression table if you had some, uh, you know, hypothesis testing and whatever. Um, but then one nice thing is that boot, so this boot results object that you get, I'll go back up here. Um, and this goes for, for all of them, for like mean, median, blah, blah, blah. It, it gives you the raw data. So you can do things like, um, then plot like a 95% uh, percent confidence interval just using the empirical quantiles that you got from your bootstrap samples. So um, the boot allows you to do stuff like this, uh, which is nice. Um, and let's see, what else? Oh, oh, okay, you can do other things too, but when, in somewhat, somewhat briefly, I just wanted to show you how to do this in tidy. So anyways, that's, that's the end of, of the boot part and now onto the tidy part. Uh, so they, from our, from our sample in the tidy models ecosystem, you have uh, bootstraps. And so you give it times. So I did 10,000 times the boot. So I thought I'd do 10,000 times with uh, bootstraps. Um, uh, very similar. And I didn't take the time to generalize this, um, but they, they were the function. This was just, I literally just copied this, this part from the website. Um, just a function that goes over splits so you'll, you'll map it over splits and it will give you as a data frame, the coefficients uh, from the model. And so let's see, and you can do this all within mutate, um, but I, you know, for some reason it's, it's not in mutate here. 
Um, so this is just taking the bootstrap tree samples, adding a column. This column is not being overwritten or anything. Uh, so it's, it's mapping over the splits. It's using this custom function here to get out uh, the data frame. So as a data frame, it's going to be coefficients from the model and, and yeah. And so that's it. I mean, that's actually, this is the code basically to do a 10,000 10, bootstraps in the tidy, in tidy models framework. And then, you know, um, so just to see what you get, uh, you get the split object bootstrap, and then um, this was the result of their mapping um, that. Uh, and then, so you get, uh, then you can access individual um, regression results. Uh, so, so these are the parameter estimates from a certain, boot, well, the first bootstrap sample. Um, what was this? Oh yeah. Uh, so, but you know, you do need to get these out. So these are, you can see they're, they're in there. So there are two ways to get them out. Um, you can either create a data frame that's just uh, binding the rows. And again, this, this code will be up for perpetuity. So I don't expect it to be intelligible on the first go through. Uh, or you can just unnest them. Um, and you can get the, which is, this is probably like the tidyverse, the tidy models approved way of doing it is, so you're keeping this all in the same ob object. You've got your split, your bootstrap ID, and then you've, uh, you've just unnested all the coefficients. Uh, so I think, I think the way on the bottom is the way to go. Uh, and then once you've done that, um, you know, you, you're, just, uh, you're just a pivot longer away from doing nice little things like these. Um, so, so this was what my research question was interested. Uh, it's not super interesting, but you know, different publication rates for different uh, like NSF directorates, so National Science Foundation, basically like, so this is, you know, computer, computer science, engineering, geology, all compared to, these are dummy variables. So the sampling distribution of uh, parameters for dummy variables for these different directorates compared to biology. <clears throat> so you can see mathematical and physical sciences out there publishing a lot. My field, social and behavioral economic, like social sciences, behavioral economics, uh, not publishing so much. Uh, you know, you see, there it is, engineering, relatively well. Uh, actually, it has a really long tail. That's why that looks like it's well estimated, but it's not. It's a secret. Anyway, so so that's it. That's the that's my mishmash of section five point three, tidy models, autobiography. I hope that was uh, decent. All right, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. If any of you have questions, uh, Dude, that wasn't decent. That was great. That's a, a god awful amount of work. I'm so. Hey, uh, so when can we get our hands on this? I, mean, I, can, <laughs> I can. I uh, can. I can just put up the PDF instantly. Um, but then, like I said, I'll have to talk with John about how to make this acceptable to to merge. But yeah, if any of you need this now it's totally fine um yeah we we'll figure out how to get it in because very nice for sure thank you yeah no my pleasure definitely like the, some of that it looked like like that was serious work you should totally take advantage of stack overflow if you don't normally because uh -huh. max and julia are on it and they will usually respond within 24 hours so like I know some of what you, so what you did is brilliant. Some of what you did, there's verbs in tidy models to do the, the, the work for you. Mm -hmm. And so what I will eventually code this up. And so I'll try and map the hard work you did to the, the verbs, but it would be, you'd probably get good responses from them for, I did this, what's, <laughs> what's the easier way to do this? I've been thoroughly impressed with how fast they, they respond. Right. And also the, the guy, um, starts with an E, the guy who did the, the Tidy Models um, website for this book, he's also all over Stack Overflow and he's answered uh, some of my questions. Emil. Emil, and thank you. Also, all of the above are fairly active on R4DS right now. So you can also just ping them in questions and often they'll answer right on R4DS. Um, they aren't in the ISLR channel currently, but maybe we could get them interested. 
Yeah, I'm sure they're pretty busy. But yeah. Emil know. actually might be because he's working with ISLR quite a bit. But he just started at our studio yesterday, day before, something like that. So he might be busy this week. That's good gossip right there. <laughs> Yeah, I was excited to see him get hired because he does lots of um, interesting work, you know, the kind of things that uh, they want him to do full time. So it's good to see. All right. So um, is Daniel is not on the call. Daniel is signed up for actually all of chapter six. Um, but I'm actually not certain that he is still in this cohort. Uh, so um, we will sort that out in the slack of what we're doing next week. Um, I would like to try to wrap up chapter six. Um, I mean, ideally as much as possible next week, because we've got next week's the 14th, the week after is the 21st. I probably won't be available for that one. Um, anyway, so trying to get this, uh, wrapped up for the new year would be great. Um, and we'll, t like I said, we'll talk in the chat if things fall apart, maybe we'll see you next year. We'll see if, uh, if we don't have anyone ready to cover next week. So I will let everyone know. Um, yeah, chapter six is a long one. It makes up for chapter five being short. Um, so I don't know. I'm not sure. We'll see what it takes to get through it. But um, we'll discuss that in the chat. Does anyone have anything else for today to talk about? Uh, I just wanted to mention that um, I think that if in a pinch um, someone needs to present next week that's not scheduled, I might be able to do it. So just FYI. OK. Um, then yes, we will have a meeting next week, one way or another. Oh, but uh, no, knowing would be good. I would like to know as soon as yes. possible. Yes, yeah, I will. Uh, I'll check with Daniel. I he signed up way at the beginning, and then I think the other cohort is more convenient for him. So I will see. He might have joined that one, um, and we, we'll see. So I will tell you hopefully today. <laughs> All right, excellent. I will see everyone in the Slack. Bye.